Well, hey, happy Sunday, everyone. So glad you guys are here. Uh, special welcome to those of you here at the Alton Darby Broadcast Campus. And very special welcome to, eight, man, just each and every one of you across the six additional campuses. Thank you so much for keeping worship a top priority in your life. And I would just say congratulations on surviving the double winter we all had this past week. You know, so we made it. Spring is on the way. It's right around the corner. Uh, we are kicking off a brand new series called Dream Chasers. <clears throat> but before I do that, I want to tell you a story. This is a super short story. I'm going to tell you the story in three pictures. We're going to celebrate a birthday in the middle of it. But I will tell you, I was thinking this story in a summary version kind of captures what Dream Chasers is all about. All right. Here's the first picture. The first picture is a tree that looks like a nondescript tree. Uh, some of you might recognize this. I'll tell you where it is. Um, <clears throat> it's right next to the Perkins that just went out of business. <laughs> it's, uh, it's off a of 70, 270 Rome Hilliard exit, right next to my favorite Wendy's where I get my chili pretty much every day in the winter. Anyway, it was several years ago. It was about six, seven years ago. Uh, Serena and I, we started praying, believing that God was calling us as a church not just to reach the next community like we typically do with multi-site in our campuses, but to reach the, a, a new particular demographic, primarily being those who speak Spanish. And we started praying about this, and God continued to impress and say, yep, you, you guys should do this. I want you to do this. And, and praying, who can we think of? And there's, there's one couple in particular that we've known for 20 years uh, Pastor Julio and Raquel uh, Obando, and we met them, some of you remember this, this is a super long time ago, 20, 22 plus years ago, uh, we sent teams to a church in Costa Rica, Tres Rios, right outside of San Jose, every year for about 12 years to help them build a church, and then after we built the church called The Building, then we helped them build the church, and, and the people, and it's thriving, and it's robust. Ra uh, Raquel was the pastor's daughter, and Pastor Julio was our translator. And, and this is like two decades ago, and I was like, I wonder what they're doing. I wonder what God has them up to, and tracked them down. They just recently moved to the United States. They're living in Iowa, feeling like God had something for them. And that's the tree that, uh, it was four years ago, that's the tree that we pulled under, because it was summer, and it was it's sitting in the shade, it was hot. And we had a 45-minute conversation with uh, Julio and Raquel. Says, I think God's up to something. I want you to pray about, are you going to be a part of this or not? And they clearly said, yeah, we feel like God is calling us to this. And, and there was a whole bunch of additional conversations. But Julio and Raquel, they packed their family up. They moved here. Um, and then we started Cyprus Espanol. And it started literally with a dream uh, based upon a prompting of God, lots of prayer, discernment, and conversations. That's the tree where the first phone call took place. And then here's a second picture. This was just a couple weeks. Uh, Espanol had over 350 last week, and today is their second birthday. So let's congratulate Espanol. So incredible. Um, if you're not familiar with like church work, typically that's unheard of to start with nothing and to see God moving. And the, the most significant picture is the third one. Uh, it's just change life after change life after change life. And I'm telling you, it's happening at every single campus and Jesus Christ gets all the glory. Let's thank him one more time for that. Absolutely incredible. Dream chasers. You know, I, I've been asked a lot, uh, over the past few days, I was like, oh, Easter is incredible. And how many people did we have? And the answer is well over 11,000. It's closer to 11,300 than anything. But I said, that's a great question to ask. But I, for me, th there's two other significant questions I think that are even more important. And the first question is a question for all of us, myself included. What's my next step on my spiritual journey? Because what I know to be true is we all have room to grow, amen? Amen. And that's, uh, okay, like a third of us caught that. I snuck that in there. <laughs> Let me do it one more time. We all have room to grow, amen? amen. And some of you can turn to the person that he's talking to you right now. No, again, anyway. <laughs> but we do. And then it's not just what's my next step with my room to grow. The second question is who's the next person for me to love with the love of Jesus the same way that he loved me? Because for 2,000 years, that's how the baton of faith gets passed from one generation to the next and from one person to the next. It's as we continue to grow every day, and as long as we're still living, there's still more room for us to take, but then it's sharing that love in a gracious, loving way, to love others with the same love that Christ Jesus loved us, and that's how 
uh, it's just something so special is built where Christ gets the honor and people get hope and love in a way that changes them forever. This series, Dream Chasers, I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. Um, lay it out here for you. The first two weeks of the series, we're going to set the foundation in place. Uh, what, what does it even mean to be a dream chaser? Uh, weeks three and four, we're going to talk about what I think are probably two of the most important characteristics and attributes each one of us has to develop if we're going to live and achieve the dreams that God intends for us to. And then the last handful of weeks, we're going to look at profiles uh, of people from Scripture uh, who have lived incredible lives, they, they lived incredible dreams, and see what can we learn uh, that we could apply in our lives and how does that inspire us. Dreams is something innate in each and every one of us that we always wonder, is there something more? And I think part of that reason is because God designed us and he built us that way. I became curious, and I even started doing some research. I said, I wonder how many hit songs have the name dream in the title or the concept of dreaming for something more. Now, <clears throat> uh, every Christmas, we have friends who host a Christmas party, and we play games. And I'll be honest, I really don't like the trivia part, but there's one part I love, and it's called the hum game. Have anyone ever played the humming game? Anyone? Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, like, hmm, 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 Like, what is that? We wish you a Merry Christmas. You got it. There you go. So what I thought we would do today is we would have just a little bit of fun. I'm not going to hum it for you, but I'm going to give you just a couple of bars of, of three songs. I expect one particular demographic to really know the first one, most of you to know the second one, and a younger demographic will know the third one, all right? And it all has something to do with dreams. So when you get ready, uh, let's do song number one. Okay, if you know, all right. Okay, anyone know that song? Raise your hand. There you go, a lot of you. That was California Dreamin' by the Mamas and Papas, and you get a bonus point if you knew it was the year 1965. Now, second song, I'm going to cut it down even shorter. Here's the second song. Okay, stop that one, right? Oh, yeah, let's see, lots of hands right there. Uh, Dream On, uh, 1973, Steven Tyler and Aerosmith. And we're going to do the shortest amount of time for this third one. Here's the third song. Okay, uh, see, yeah, there's a lot of the younger people I see in here raising their hand. That is uh, Teenage Dream, Katy Perry. Don't even have time to get into J. Cole, The Eurythmics, Fleetwood Mac, Gary Wright, Dreamweaver, and all the rest. But there's so many hit songs that have to do with this theme and this concept. There's got to be more. Think of some of the most famous speeches you've heard throughout history. Martin Luther King had a dream. John F. Kennedy had a dream. There's a lot of people who have shared their dreams. I, I think as kids... I think almost, probably not all, but almost all little boys and little girls grow up with dreams. And I think, you know, sometimes little boys, they grow up with dreams like they're going to hit home runs. They're going to grow up and be a firefighter. Little girls grow up and they, they dream of their wedding, what it's going to look like one day. We all have dreams but I think if the truth be known, we have the dream until something happens and then we say to ourselves, and it's often an internal dialogue, we say, it wasn't supposed to go that way. This isn't how I played the dream out in my head when I took that first job. I, I, I had a special relationship, and I kind of had a dream of how I thought it was going to go, and it didn't go that way. And as we start this series, Dream Chasers, and I've really been praying and thinking about it, and I really think we're all in, in, we're all in the same boat. We're, we're in different categories or different sections of the boat, but there's some of us, you had a dream, and something happened, and you've parked it to the wayside, and I just want to tell you, just, I want you to be open that God might say it's time for you to dream, uh, to dream a new dream again. And maybe you've had a dream and it's, not, it's just not happening. And, and maybe what God's word to you is going to be over the next few weeks, I want you to dream a different dream and a better dream than anything you could even imagine today. Some of us have a dream, but truth be known, we're scared to death. 
We're scared to death to take a step on it because once we take a step and if we would ever go verbal with our dream, now I'm accountable to it. So I keep it inside of me and I just, it's, it's an internal mental battle because I think of all the reasons why it's not going to work and I can't do it. And, and it just, it forces me to just kind of live this mundane life. And I just want you to be open maybe for the voice of the Lord to speak to you as well and say, God's going to do something in you and through you you could never do yourself. And for some of us, we're just kind of hanging out and we've kind of heard people have dreams, but that's not us. And I want you to be open to the realization that God does have a dream for your life. And you'll never truly experience all the joy, all the love, and all the purpose that God intended for you to experience in this life until you discover the dream and you begin pursuing it on a daily basis. You know, when you think of dream chasers, dream chasers, uh, there's only two parts to it. One is God's revelation to us where God reveals to us himself, his plan, his goal, his dream, and his desire for us. And then the second part is what we do with it and how we live that out on a daily basis. When you turn to scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, even into the New Testament, God's revelation he would often speak to people, sometimes even in an audible voice. Uh, I personally have never heard the audible voice of God, but God speaks to us through Scripture and, and through a variety of other means. But when God was speaking to Moses and God said, hey, I got a, I got a plan for your life. You're going to be my leader. You're going to go to Egypt. God was speaking from a burning bush in an audible voice to a guy named Moses. There's so many other examples. I just threw together a, a super quick list where God spoke to people in dreams. And you got Jacob, Laban, Joseph. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Joseph. That's a fascinating story. Uh, Joseph was the youngest boy with a bunch of older brothers. Joseph had a dream. (laughs) This is crazy. But in his dream, all his older brothers bowed down to him and were paying him honor. Now, in the naiveness of Joseph, when he woke up, he told them that. I mean, there are some dreams you should probably process more to yourselves. You know, how should I say this if I should say this? Joseph said that, and then the older brothers, I mean, they hated him for that and many other reasons. And they decided uh, to kill him, not like today, like, I'm gonna, I hate you, I'm going to kill you. No, like, legit, we're going to kill you. And then the voice of reason spoke up through one brother, and this is terrible, but he's like, no, we'll actually profit if we sell him into slavery for the rest of his life. I mean, it's, it's twisted, but read it all in your own time. Um, but that was part of the dream. And, and then you go, Gideon, Solomon, uh, Pilate's wife, Matthew 27, Pilate, you know, he had, that's just before Easter, Jesus was before him, and uh, Pilate was like, uh, I don't think he's guilty. And then he went to the people, do you want Jesus or Barabbas? And the people said, give us Barabbas, who is a horrible criminal. And um, they said, crucify, crucify Jesus. Pilate's wife had a dream literally that night before said, this is an innocent man. And Pilate then, he brought out water, a bowl, he washed his hands. He goes, I'm innocent of this man's blood. His blood being Jesus is on you horrible. The people said, let his blood be on us and our children. And there's so many times in scripture, God communicated through a dream. Now, today, the primary means of revelation is God's given us the advantage they didn't have called scripture. We have the Bible. And there's a lot of times today we have questions and we're seeking answers. I'm telling you, every answer can be found in scripture if we just know the right place to look. And there's some things that, you know, I've heard people say, I'm just kind of praying, you know, should I do this or should I do this? Some of the questions we even pray about, you don't even need to pray about it. God's already answered your question. We just need to be diligent enough to kind of seek the answers. But God speaks through songs. He speaks through uh, communicators. He speaks through our small group. He speaks through people. But everything will always, always, always align with the principles of of scripture because that is God's revelation to us and Jesus revealed to us through scripture. So to set a foundation in place, here we go, week one, what does it mean for us to be a dream chaser? The first thing that's in your notes on the app, but if you wanna write it down, is to realize God 
has an amazing plan and purpose for my life. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to read this together. Every campus, we're going to read it together on the count of three. One, two, three. God has an amazing plan and purpose for my life. Now, that was not bad. I think we can do better, though. So let's do it one more time. Robust, good voice here. One, two, three. God has an amazing plan and purpose for my life. And God has a universal plan. That's kind of the whole love God, love people thing. John 10, 10, Jesus came and he said, the enemy's goal is to steal, rob, destroy, kill, and to snatch away the good things that the heavenly father intends for you. And then Jesus says, John 10, 10, I have come that you may have a rich, full, abundant life. That is God's plan for life. That is God's plan for each of our lives. But God personalizes it underneath this overarching umbrella. God has a unique plan, listen to this, for every single one of us. And because he has a plan, then he has gifts, he has passions, and your life will never be the best that it possibly could be until you discover those individual plans and you're pursuing those plans and purposes feeding into God's universal plan for all people. And we know this is true from Scripture. There's one passage in Jeremiah 29, 11, Scripture says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. There are plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So God is thinking about you. Think about this. In the whole history of all humanity, go all the way back to Adam and Eve, there never has been and there never will be anyone quite like you. In the future of all humanity, until Christ returns, there's also never going to be anyone just quite like you. That makes your life so unique, literally one of a kind, handcrafted by God. We know this is true, again, according to Scripture. In Psalm, Psalm 139, Scripture says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watch me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life is recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot even be numbered. And we read that passage, and rightly so, we often think of unborn children. We think of people, um, you know, the baby, and she's pregnant, and we say to ourselves, God formed them, God knows them, and God has an incredible plan for their life, even before the day they are physically born. Every day of their life has been mapped out, and it's true, and that is true, but listen to me and lean in a little bit here. It's true for you, too. And it doesn't matter how many days of your physical life you've lived to this point. It's still true that God has an amazing plan and a purpose for your life. And there's future things that God has in store for you to experience and for you to accomplish and for love to you to receive and to share. And that's part of what it means to be a dream chaser. Is to realize that God is calling us for more than what currently is. Let me give you the second building block for what it means to be a dream chaser, and it's simply this, is to stay connected to the dream giver. A lot of times what we want is the dream, but what we really don't need is the dream. The dream is the byproduct product. What we need is more of Jesus in our life. Uh, John chapter 14, John chapter 15, they're two fascinating passages. In John chapter 14, I'll summarize it. Jesus is the one teaching And he says, the Father and I are one. Uh, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What you've seen me do and what what you've seen or heard me speak, these words are not my own. They come from the one who has sent me, for we are one. That's John 14. John 15, Jesus says... I'm the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So people sometimes ask the question like, well, what do I need to do to figure out whatever the dream is or the plan is that God has for my life? And my encouragement is you need to get as close as you can and take steps daily to become the person that God wants you to become as he reveals it to us through Scripture and through your small group. 
That, that literally is what getting started is all about. Getting started is to help each one of us to discover God's plan for our lives and then to put us into a position where we can be successful and passionate and experience the level of love and joy and peace and purpose that God intended for us. It's all about you. It's all about us as individuals discovering God's plan. I was having a conversation with a friend just this past week and they're explaining their life to a certain point, and it was good, and then they have kids, and it was busy, and they're doing their deal, and they have a job, and all the rest, and they're in a small group, and they serve, and they go to church, and they're kind of everything. And then the person, it's a gal, she said, I was sitting in service one particular day, and she goes, be honest, I don't even remember what the sermon was about, I don't remember really so much the songs, but I felt like God said, hey, this is what I want you to do with your life for the rest of your life and the next season of life. And she said it was scary and it was big and I started doing it a few years ago and I've never been happier in my life. And we're talking about it and then what this gal said, she said, <clears throat> she said, when I, what I realized in hindsight, the reason I was able to hear from God is because I was in the right place where my eyes and my ears could be open. So part of being a dream chaser is doing the right things where we can not only draw close to God, but we can actually hear from him. Let me give you the third thing, the third, the third building block to become a dream chaser. And it's simply this. We have to learn how to strategically let go. And I'm going to give you three things you have to be willing to let go of. The first one is your past. Years ago, I, I wrote something down and I said, in life, your dreams always have to be bigger than your memories. If your memories are bigger than your dreams, then you're living in the past, always looking back. And I think there's two parts of the past we have to be willing to let go of. Sometimes the past was really good and we want to hold on to it and it's hard to let go. And if we're holding on to what was really good, it's hard to experience and to live all the future things God has in store. There's other times the past, we would like to let go, but the past doesn't quite seem to be able to let go of us. And that's a mutual relationship. And when the past was not good, if we don't let go, we'll never experience the peace and the joy and all that God has for our present and our future. The past can inform us, but the sole basis of the Christian life, listen to me, it's always about what's yet to come, amen? Amen. It's about eternity, it's about God's presence, and about the things that will last forever. And it's a super small handful with a bunch of fingers left over because people are the only thing that will truly last forever. I, I, I think this is in part what Paul was referring to. And, and Paul, he had some good things happen in his past. He had some not good things happen in his past. He had a lot of things he wasn't proud of from his past. Um, but Jesus Christ, he, he, he cleansed them. He, he took those things away and he, he shaped them and he made them into a new person. And that's part of what Paul is talking about being on the journey in Philippians 3. And Paul says, hey, it's not that I've already obtained all of this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Every significant breakthrough in Scripture Every significant miracle in Scripture, every significant thing we read about in Scripture where God is alive and at work in a person's life, there's always a turning point where they're able to let go of the past and to take a step, to step into the new thing that God intends for them. And listen, often new things, they're unfamiliar things, they can be scary things, but it's the very thing God's calling us to. Go back even to when Israel was in bondage and captivity for 400 years. That means multiple generations. For multiple generations, all they knew was slavery, bondage, captivity. That's when God told Moses, hey, you're going to lead these people from uh, the land of slavery to a land that I promised your forefathers many, many, many generations ago. When the people were in the middle of the desert, what did they want to do? It got tough and they wanted to go back to the old way of living and the old way of thinking. And they started to rationalize in their minds all the reasons why they shouldn't trust God. And I read the Bible and I'm like, man, come on, you guys. Like, he did everything for you. 
And it's good until I reflect on my own life. I'm like, come on, Murphy. Like, he's doing everything for me. Trust him. And what did the Lord say through the prophet Isaiah? Forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. I'm doing a new thing. It springs up right now. And God Almighty is the one and only who can make freshwater springs flow from the desert wasteland. Amen? There's a new thing God longs to do. When the past was really good, how do you move forward? You have to give God praise and be encouraged for who he is and what he's done. But then you have to channel that praise to inspire you to have new levels of faithfulness. When God proves himself to be faithful, which he does time and time again, faithfulness mandates that we step out of our comfort zone, out of our resources, beyond what we could do ourselves. If we can accomplish everything ourselves, we're not trusting God. God calls us to live by faith, not by sight. When the past was not good, how do you move forward? Let me begin by saying this. There are some things that happen in this life, I'm going to be honest, you're never going to forget. The whole forgive and forget thing, I don't even know where that came from, but it's not true. But what is true is Jesus Christ can heal you. And through forgiveness, through the maintaining of good boundaries, and through a lot of counseling and a lot of healing, God can heal you to the point where you can move forward. I've told people on occasion, I, I've had uh, actually four shoulder surgeries through the years. I still have the scars to prove it on the back of my shoulders. <clears throat> but there's a lot of things I can do today. It's, I, I, I've healed, I've gone to therapy, I've, I, and, you know, I can do all the stuff, but it's, it's something that will be with me for the rest of my life. And there's some of us, there's some things that happen to you unfairly. I, it, you're you're going to probably have that memory with you for the rest of your life, but through Jesus Christ, that memory doesn't have to hold you hostage in your past. Amen? God has a dream for you. And he doesn't cause all things negative and bad to happen, but he can use it and he can do a work in us and through us. Uh, just real quickly, let me give you the next two here. What do you let go of? You need to let go of your insecurities. Listen, we all have insecurities. I've always said, just some of us hide them better than others. Even when God called Moses, hey, you're going to be my man, what did Moses say? Uh, Moses, he pleaded with the Lord, oh, Lord, dear God, I'm not very good with words. I've never been. I'm not now. I, even though you spoke to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get easily tangled. The first thing that Moses thought of is all the reasons why he can't do this. But, and, and thank God that Moses didn't say, no, I'm out because I don't feel like I talk that good. But what Moses didn't have the advantage of, which you and I do because it's the New Testament, it's 1 Thessalonians 5.24, he who calls you is faithful to complete the calling that he's given you. Listen to me, God gets a kick out of using us to do things we know we can't do ourselves because he is the one who gets all the credit, amen? It, it, it's Acts chapter 4, it, it was the, the boldness of a guy named Peter, a guy named John, they were proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it says it was that the people were amazed at what they said, the power, the boldness with which they said, and then it's almost thrown in there like a little subtext, and it says some of those who were uh, gathered recognized these were unschooled, uneducated, ordinary men. In other words, if you and I are developing the dream team for a business entrepreneur startup, we're not choosing any of the disciples to be on the dream team. But Christ said, no, you're just the one that I want because when I do a work in you and through you, there'll be no question who's doing the work. It's God himself. Here's the last thing to let go of. It's to let go of my need for all the details and control. Listen to me really carefully. There will come a point in the process you're going to have to make a plan and to lay out your plan and get godly wisdom to enter into the plan. But there's a lot of dreams that get, become void because the minute God gives us the dream, we're like, well, I need to know all the details and like how and all the rest. No, we don't need to know those things at the beginning of the process. We just need to be willing to say, yes, Lord, I, I'm in. And you know what I find how God most often works in life? It doesn't, he doesn't give us the whole plan. He gives us what we need to take the next step. And then when we're faithful to take that step, then he gives you the next step. 
And it goes on and on and on and on. And when it comes to being a dream chaser, there's a passage in Proverbs uh, chapter 3. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in everything that you do, and he will show you which path to take. And that is the promise of the word of God. Amen? He promises. But what it mandates is a humble, submissive spirit. Just like when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying and the honest prayer Jesus prayed was, I don't know that I want to do this. This isn't really my plan. But he, he was so obedient, he was so faithful, and he was so loving. He got to a point, what did Jesus pray? Not my will. Not my dream. Not my plan. Your will, your dream, your will be done. Here on earth, in me and through me, exactly as you see fit in heaven. And when that's the posture of our heart and, the, and God gives us the courage and the faithfulness to take another step, that's when miracles happen. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Every campus, every campus, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and stand with me right now. Worship team's going to make their way out to the platform. So go ahead and stand up. Stand up every campus. Worship teams, make your way on out to the platform. And I'm going to give you a final prayer. And this prayer is an eyes wide open prayer. If you want to close your eyes, you can. But I want you to leave your eyes open. I want you to be looking forward to where we're heading and what you're getting yourself into. And here's the other thing I'm going to ask every campus to do. If you're comfortable, just put one hand up like this, all right? One hand up like this. If you want to do this, you can. If you're like me, you just kind of like, yeah, I'm right here. Just, just, I'm here, I'm here. One hand. And this is a means of receiving what I'm going to be praying for you, all right? So here I'm going to pray it right now, every campus. Here's the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray right now for the person who had a dream and something happened and they've parked it. Give them your spirit to dream again. I pray, Father, for the person who has a dream but it's not big enough yet. Help them to dream bigger. You said it in your word, God. Help them to dream bigger than anything they could imagine right now. And then when they begin to live that dream, there's no question it's you living it in them and through them. And I pray for the person who's so hurt right now from something in the past, would you heal them so that they could live again, experience joy again and peace and healing. And for the marriages, God, it's not that they're not living the dream right now. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would do the work that only you can do. And for the loved one, for the child, Lord, that... You, Whatever it is you want to do in us and through us as a church, would you give us eyes to see and dreams to dream and people to love because it is the only thing that matters on planet Earth is that people come to know you and to love you and to experience the dream that you have for each one. We trust you. We love you. We pray these things in the resurrected name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. <laughs>